Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this daily science fiction extravaganza, commonly known as Tales, Tales from Out from space. Out, space, out, space. Out. Taken from the subreddit HFY. All the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider supporting the channel. On to the science fiction. Story number one. What makes a name? Written by Radius 55. Did you know we name our ships? Unlike yourselves, humans have never been satisfied riding to war upon a number. For as long as we have sailed across the seas and stars, we have given names to the ships that took us there. But what makes a name? Some we named for our homelands, like Nuremberg to Yamato to Ohio and more, Deutschland, Kagar, Sydney, Akagi and Texas. Places to remember, places where sailors had come from, places they knew they might never see again. The lands, navies existed to protect above all else. Others are more abstract, constitution, independence, victory, things to fight for, ideals with no true form, but a deep meaning for those aboard. Then too, independence, vanguard, enterprise, and indefatigable qualities that make the ship and people great. We named our ships for battles as trophies or memories of our invocations of past glories. We called them Midway and Yorktown and Poltava and Trafalgar, Iowa Jimmy and Gungat, places where humans died fighting, forever painted on the sides of massive wood and iron and steel. They inspired men and women who served on them through victory and defeat. So too did we name our craft for our heroes, generals and leaders of war, like the Nimitz and Churchill and Bismarck and Kuznestov and Charles de Gaulle and Hood. All fought for their homelands and their people. We immortalized their names by giving them our warships so that their crews might inherit some of their greatness in their namesakes. As humanity traveled the stars, we brought our traditions with us. We named our early ships after pioneers who got us there, who broke the trails that others' worlds through ideas and deeds. The Neil Armstrong and the Yuri Gagarin for those who took our first steps out of our home world. The Einstein, the Galileo, Curie, Kabiri, and the Von Braun for those whose work paved the wave. And we named our ships for the places that we wanted to take them. Andromeda, Bulf, Ceres, Orion, and Centauri. All full of hope and optimistic for the times to come. You won't find a single ship by any of those names in this fleet. A few short years ago, the names of the ships under my command would have been unthinkable. No man or woman would have contemplated serving aboard a craft called Xenocide. Today, every sailor stands ready for battle at my side. Devastator, Annihilation, Reaver, Despair, Merciless, and Executioner. These are not the names a human fleet has ever seen, not before you came. You drove us to this, to the point where names like Unforgiven, Wrath, and Extermination are the norm. I do not believe you comprehend the magnitude of the ship that this represents, but after what you did, the change was inevitable. Have you ever read any human theology? We have quite a bit, much of it still actively practiced. Interesting that the three most common monotheistic religions all have a name for beings of evil, which is how I now command the ships Satan, Iblis, and Belial, and Abandon. Also, how I have the Hades, the Tartarus, the Yohanan, and the and Gahana, named for the places of darkness where evil resides. What's more, our religions gave us words for the ultimate destruction, Armageddon and Ragnarok, and the Yormo Odin. These are ships are named for the final battles of humanity, should tell you something. Never before have we felt the need to bestow such titles and ships, not in a millennia of constant war and struggle amongst ourselves, not until now. So, what makes a name? Pride, hope, history, 
passion, heroics, and dreams when you attacked us, burned our worlds, and murdered our brothers and sisters. You took those from us, but you gave us something too. Something that we have always had but kept buried and in check underneath the rest. What you gave us was rage. Where we once had hope, now there is wrath and turmoil and pure hatred. That is what makes a name. I hope this gives you some idea of what you have unleashed. Someday, humanity may no longer feel the need to give its warship such terrible names. I feel that on that day, we shall send the speed into the cleansing fire of our sun to expunge our shame at what we have unleashed. But today is not that day. We will keep building the ships and imbuing them with names worthy of our hate and our resolve until one of our civilizations is just dust on the solar wind. But I will guarantee you one thing. Humanity will not have run out of names. Transmission from the Human Fleet Admiral aboard the Terran ship Pale Horse. End of story. Story number two. Pet the Kitty, written by Son of Nobody. It was a fine spring day on the Onverk 4, and Steve let out a contented sigh and leaned back slightly, basking in the warm sunlight. Of course, the weather here was nearly always good. The planet had little axial tilt, and the climate was mild, predictable. That was part of why he'd been so sought after as a colony world, and why it had ended up as designated a joint colony, with more than a dozen different species settling there over the past half century. Quite a few of them were out strolling in the park today, and he watched his fellow colonists with ever-persistent curiosity. He'd lived amongst the aliens his whole life, so they weren't exactly shocking or startling, but his school had been an English-speaking school and was thus majority human, meaning that most of his friends growing up had been human too. He had several alien friends now, including Kliskrit and Akatl, who sat next to him on the bench, her large priory eyes following her son but his as he ran after Steve's daughter Emily. Akatel looked something like a praying mantis, though less slender, with four thick walking legs beneath the ovoid abdomen and two pairs of manipulator arms coming from the shoulders of an upright thorax. She was just a little bit taller than Steve when standing, and a pair of broad feathered antennae added nearly a foot to her height when they were held upright. He was still learning to read them, but they were their own way of every bit as expressive as the human facial features. Her face reminded him more of certain jumping spiders, creatures that humans found both creepy and cute, with two big black single-lensed eyes near the center, articulated and fanged mouthpieces below, and several smaller eyes bracketing the main ones. She was as lovely iridescent blue that gleamed with the green and purple highlights, and her primary manipulating limbs had a lobster-like grasping claw, while the small secondary manipulating limbs beneath them had long, delicate fingers for more fiddly work. Gliskit was more omnivorous, social, and could manage human speech, and they and humans had got along quite well, despite the fact that they looked very different. A few arachnophobes amongst the humans couldn't quite handle being so close to them, but Steve had been told that it was Crisket found humanity naked, flexible skin disturbing too. So there was commonality as much as a difference. Most aliens Steve had encountered were either furred or furnished with exoskeletons. A few were slimy. Humanity's dry bare skin seemed to be highly unusual. As if to illustrate that, the burial walked past Steve's bench, a short, bulky creature moving with surprising bounce from something that looked like a furry ottoman. Burial were a heavy gravity species, so they were built like bricks, and could jump as high as any human in a comparatively low gravity of a world like Omaverk 4. The burial were a typical of his species, with a long, low body carried on six elephantine legs. A rounded head rested on the front pair of shoulders, with a huge violet eye set slightly to the side, topped with a rubbed, leaf-shaped ears and swiveled about as he walked. He was covered all over in pale lilac fur. While marking him as male, the females tended to be blue, and there was a third sex that was usually a dark purple. 
There were more slender manipulator limbs tucked away under the fluffy fur, but they weren't visible when not in use. A stubby tail, striped with darker purple, waved behind cheerfully as the burial continued along the path, apparently in good spirits. Akatel's involuntary alarm click and Emily's exclamation of Kitty arrived at almost precisely the same moment, and before Steve could even get to his feet, Emily had rocketed across the lawn and nearly tackled the burial. She was taller than the compact alien, and even at just four years old, but he was considerably denser and stronger than she, and with a startled bray, he jumped sideways, away from her. The jump sent her sprawling on her back and the grass with a surprised yelp, and by the time she started to pick herself up, Steve was at her side. It was instantly obvious that she wasn't injured, so he turned his attention to the burial. I'm very sorry, sir. She's young, but she should know better. The burial snorted, eyeing Steve, and he knew that despite the alien not even coming up to his waist, the burial could definitely take him out of this turned into a fight. The burial snorted again, and Steve felt his pulse racing. He really didn't want things to turn violent, especially not in front of Emily, not to mention but his and Ectol. But the burial finally said, Apology accepted, teach your spawn to keep her manipulators to herself. He shook himself all over, fluffing up his long, soft, enticing lilac fur, and resumed his walk along the path. Steve let out a sigh of relief, tension draining out of him, and then turned to Emily. Emily, what do you think you were doing? She scuffed her foot and didn't meet his eyes. Wanted to pet the kitty, she muttered. Steve shook his head. That wasn't a kitty, and you know it. That was a burial, a person. We don't touch people without their permission, okay? Okay. So what will you do next time you see a burial? Ask to pet. Steve struggled to keep a stirred expression. Her response wasn't what he expected, but he should have expected it. All things considered. That's right. Most people don't like being petted, though, so they will probably say no. And what do you do if they say no pets? Don't pet. Exactly. Now go on. Petiz is probably bored. Okay, Daddy. Emily raced off where Petiz was standing in the lowest level of the play structure, the incident already completely forgotten. Steve shook his head and returned to the bench, where Akatel was holding her antenna in a by now familiar angle of amusement. Another thing like the licking, she likes to pet people. Steve felt a faint flush creep out his cheeks, but found he, he didn't want to lie about his to Akatel, even if the truth seemed oddly embarrassing. Not quite like the licking... Humans grow out of licking everything. She'll probably stop that very soon. But we never grow out of the urge to pet soft things. I'm afraid that every time I see a burial, I have to restrain myself from touching them. All humans do. Akatel waved the antenna up and down in a particular pattern, moving from amusement to disbelief, which more or less meant that she was laughing. Really? All humans? Pretty much, yes, and it's not just burial, any furred creatures can cause this urge. It's actually led to a few minor diplomatic incidents involving adult humans with poor impulse control. Akatal flicked her antenna again. I wonder if I will ever come to the end of discovering human strangeness. Steve couldn't help but chuckle at that. Considering humans, uh, probably not. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode, and I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.